I don't think so. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It's great to see everyone here after our snow day. My partner in crime, Kathleen Smith, and myself, we're going to uh, take a few minutes, probably about 25, 30 minutes, and talk about some of the topics and trends in education. Kathleen is not, not feeling very well, so she's going to try to chime in when she can and is not coughing. But just our agenda for the talk today. Um, very clarify what the talk's about. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Langley's academic leadership team. Of course, we're going to dive into the topics and trends in education and then our work at Langley um, in those areas. So just to clarify what this talk is not first, that a lot of times in topics and trends, you'll hear the words progressive or conservative or liberal. We are not talking about uh, Bernie Sanders. We're not talking about Ted Cruz. Um, and actually, really, none of the campaigns are talking about education too much. Um, so this is a non-political talk. But if you hear us say progressive or traditional in terms of methods, we're not referring to any um, political candidates. So that's that's our disclaimer. Um, we into this. So academic leadership team, Kathleen's going to try to talk through a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely, part of you know being at Langley is pushing through and persevering. I think it's been hard. Um, so we have this team that meets once a week, the academic leadership team, and we formed that um, actually right before Eleanor started, and it was an opportunity for a small group of us to meet weekly and really talk about what's happening in terms of all of the things that Phil and I are going to talk about today in terms of um, academic trends and sort of how we're bringing that <coughs> excuse me, to the fore in our programming um, throughout the school. So that consists of, of Eleanor, of me, of Phil, of the three division heads, um, Brad, our director of technology, Amy Jones, our Director of Resource, and Brent Locker, Junior Students. And we're really focused on instructional leadership. So we have, just like we encourage all of our faculty to do, we have um, our guiding essential questions for the year. And, and really what we're thinking about this year is what is the role of an academic leader, and how do we implement that in ways that um, sort of bring the entire academic team in the school and faculty and others along. Um, so we're going to talk about what that team is focused on this year throughout the, the course of our time with you this morning. Um, and we're informed by certainly research and the trends that you'll hear us talking about today. Um, you know, we are reading these things, these articles, you know, sorry, these publications that you see up in front of you. We're also we're going to talk about somebody in a few minutes. <clears throat> excuse me, named Kim Marshall, who came and did some professional development with him. And so many of us um, are receiving a weekly memo from him, which sort of brings together 10 or 12 articles um, throughout the course of the week that sort of academic leaders throughout the country are reading and talking about, which is a nice little, it's like a mama bird sort of chewing up all these little bites and spitting them right in your mouth to know that it's great. So we also have um, our summer reading that happens every summer. Our team is really thinking about how do we pull forth some of the trends that we're hearing about so that our faculty can be reading and talking together um, and really sort of be on the forefront of of what's happening in education. And it's funny, I think we are we're doing pretty well because the books that we have read, for the most part, I hear from most other schools about two years after, that, oh, we're reading that this summer, so that makes us feel really good. It makes us feel like we're really thinking about, um, you know, oh, did you, you know, have you heard about this guy, Tony Wagner? Like, yeah, we already did that already. He talked to our faculty years ago. So that makes us feel really good. It makes us feel like we're sort of on the front of, of what's happening. Um, many of those other names that you see up in front of you are focused on some of the the trends that we'll be talking about today, um, Jamie Ty, Graham Wiggins, um, sort of the, the frameworks for understanding by design framework, for which we use our, um, so that's this curriculum framework that we look at, just looking at big understandings and essential questions. Um, Carol Dweck talking about mindset. So Phil's gonna dive into a lot of this as well. Um, but really trying to, to pull in a lot of sort of the big thinkers um, that are out there in the world of education and sort of pulling that together for for our team here. One thing to build upon um, that Kathleen said too is that a lot of times we hear at schools, they're catching up to us. When we go to conferences yeah. as well, um, we hear keynote speakers or we go to a workshop um, or see an article written. A lot of times it's reaffirming a lot of the work that we're doing here, so it feels really good. It's true. I just came from um, part of the reason I've been sick, I think, is I, I've been flying across country over the last week um, and I was at the Learning in the Brain conference in San Francisco, which was amazing. And to Phil's point, I sat through several workshops where I thought, yeah, we know that already. It's really important, you know, the, the idea of inquiry based learning. And here's all the research to support why that's a really good thing and why kids seem to be, you know, up and moving when they're learning and those sorts of things. So there were a lot of um, great opportunities for us to say, okay, yep, 
yep, yep, yep. The research and what's happening out there is really affirming what we're doing here. So that feels good, for sure. So some of the topics and trends, um, when we're looking at <laughs> workshops, conferences, um, articles, we look at uh, obviously the who, the how, the what, the why. And what that means is we're looking for conferences, research, based upon anything we're about, obviously about students and teachers, about instructional practice, um, curriculum, which is you know what we're teaching, and then the why, obviously, is the student experience and the results we get out of it. So if you dive deeper into that, um, specific topics that we're, we could be looking at under the who, the how, the what, and the why. It could be feedback and evaluation of personnel, it could be technology, it could be standards and benchmarks, 21st century skills. I mean, just a variety, and this is just a sampling of the things that are out there. I mean, this could be a, a, just a giant bucket list. But these are the things that, um, in general, that we look at. Also, in particular today, we want to talk to you about two really important uh, topics. Uh, one is teacher quality. Uh, and the other is professional development, and they're obviously related. And one, one stat to know about is that um, across the country, not just independent schools, but public schools as well, 50% of all teachers entering the profession uh, will leave the profession in the first five years, which is just astounding. Uh, and they're saying a lot of it is that because of there's not a lot of support and, and meaningful professional development to keep teachers in the classroom. So that's what I'm going to fucking focus on those couple of things. So teacher quality, a lot of people don't know this is the single most important factor in student achievement. That is even more important than um, race, background, gender, whatever it might be. People think, oh, if you're, if you're in a good family um, and you have good means and so on, that the kids are going to achieve a higher rate. Even more important than that is the, is the quality of the teacher. Um, and so there's been some interesting studies that have come out. And actually, just in the last year, um, independent school, NAIS, which is our National Association of Independent Schools, did a survey uh, of se several member schools and talked about what defines in terms of an independent school teacher, a high quality teacher. And these were the most important characteristics that came out from that study, from heads and assistant heads that said relationships with kids, their knowledge of pedagogy um, and expertise in the content area, a growth mindset, and then um, being able to work within a school culture. So these were all characteristics that were said. They also then talked about teacher evaluation and feedback, and there's a lot of conversation about that. This goes into the teacher quality um, conversation, and they're looking at, um, in terms of response from teachers and from heads, about do your evaluations actually evaluate, assess the qualities that you want in your faculty? Um, and the one that they point out, um, which is a little alarming, and this is across the country in public and private, is 31% looking at the student outcomes as a measurable for kids. Another interesting study was done by the Gates Foundation and called the MET study, but it's the measures of effective teachers. And again, it comes to the same conclusion that some of the other studies are saying that student outcomes are very important when you're looking at the quality of a teacher. You have to have consistent observations. It just can't be one and done. We'll dive into that in a second and show the impact of what that means. And also student feedback is becoming a very important piece uh, in the evaluation or feedback process as well. So um, again, and that was done a few years back um, by the Gates Foundation. And they're putting a lot of money into teacher development and um, evaluation. So what these two studies do have in common is that they're saying that there are definitely different methods and frequencies that are out there in terms of giving feedback to teachers. It varies from once a year, it varies to once every three years, some according to state requirements in the publics, and there's differing met methods that are out there. Walkthroughs, full observations, pre-observation conferences, post-observation conferences, check boxes, narratives, end of the year final evaluations, it just goes on and on and on with what's out there. But as we said, the most, the most important thing is that you have consistency and you're in the classrooms a lot and providing timely feedback. And that's what is kind of becoming the common factor that we're seeing in a lot of studies about feedback for, for faculty and improving teacher quality. And so three things that we were looking on and actually piloting and working on here at Langley was a three minute walkthrough, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the Marshall Method, which Kathy and I already referred to, Kim Marshall, and then lesson study. So these three things. <laughs> so looking at 
why it's important to be in the classroom, if you take those boxes and think about that as a teaching class, so over a, a teacher who teaches 180 days, five classes a day, 900 classes, if you observe once, that's what it looks like. So there is the other 899 times where there's not a lot of feedback going on. And if you think about it in terms of a teacher being rated on a one to four, four being the best, at just high, super high level. On a given day, if you're being there every day, this is what maybe a typical day would look like for a teacher who's a four. A lot of fours, threes, a couple twos every now and then, maybe one, they didn't get the coffee, whatever it might be, bad day. Um, so that's what it would look like. If a teacher with threes, that's what that looks like. Very consistently a three day. Now, when you get to teachers with twos and ones, where you're saying they're not really teaching at the level that you want them to, it looks like this. And if you think back to that one day where you're observing, right, you need a lot more feedback to move the twos to the threes and threes to the four, right? And then what you think those four days are. <laughs> when you look at thinking about the, the star that Phil pulled up, you know, a, a, anybody can pull out sort of the, a, a lesson in a bag of tricks every once in a while um, that's really going to amaze and astound, but if you think about sort of the student experience overall, what does that look like for a kid over the course of the year? Three minute walk Sure. So um, what we heard from teachers, which is I think the most important thing when you start to talk about evaluation um, and feedback, is that, you know, is that scary to teachers? And the answer is no, it's certainly not Langley. That the faculty are really interested in having the members of the academic leadership team in their classrooms. Um, you know, we will get into the models in a second, but you know, Leslie and I have been doing lots of feedback conversations over the last couple, well, when, when we've been able to because of the weather. Um, and it's, it's been so, again, they keep using that word affirming, it's been so affirming to sit with teachers and say, yeah, we, will, we want to create with you a professional learning community in which we can have these conversations. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, so we started in the fall with what's called the three-minute walkthrough. And what that means is that it's exactly what it says it is, is that you go as an academic leader into a classroom with many teams. And we went to a classroom for three minutes, which is really hard. It's really, really hard because you want to stay and sort of see what's going on. But it was amazing to, it was a, I think it was a great way for us to open a year as a team to be able to, because of the, the nature of a three-minute walkthrough is that you have lots more time to be able to see lots more classrooms. So to really be able to start the year with a sense of what was happening in a very nuanced way um, throughout the school. And you're looking at a finite number of things. You're not focusing in three minutes on every single thing that's happening in the classroom. It's impossible. So we're looking at a couple of factors. Are the students engaged? And we can talk a little bit more about what that, what that means. But it really means are kids doing what you would expect them to do or what the teacher's objective is, is that is the student behavior sort of mirroring what you would hope that objective is? Um, sort of the curriculum, so what's happening? They're doing a writer's workshop lesson, they're talking about um, writing personal narrative. What's the instructional method that's happening? Are they in small groups? Is it, um, you know, teachers are delivering a lecture? Those kinds of things. Um, and then walk the walls, which is a really important part of being in a classroom. Um, there's lots of instructional philosophies that identify this, but this idea that the classroom is, should really be a second teacher in the classroom. So, or the walls, I'm sorry, the classroom environment is important teacher. So what's happening on the walls? Is it reflective of what's happening in the classroom? Is it reflect the values in the classroom as well? And then safety, you know, that's a good moment to say, oh, that lights out, or there's really backpacks all in the way of the floor, and if there was a fire drill, that would be a problem. So that's just a sort of quick one-off sort of a thing. Um, but it was, what we heard from faculty about this is that they love that we were in the classrooms. Um, but they said, gosh, if, you, you know, if you'd only been there before, what I did two minutes before, or if you'd only stayed and saw. Um, so I think it was the right way for us to open the year and to think about um, being in classrooms, lots of classrooms, for lots of opportunities to see teachers teaching. Um, but we moved on to another model for the second trimester. It's one of the things that this, is, this turns out to be much more of a data gathering yeah. model than a feedback model, mm -hmm. that's what we found. And the teachers would say to us as well, gosh, what did you think? And it was more for a chance for us, and, and Peggy and I did a lot of lower school would go in, and, and Peggy and I could sit and say, hey, we saw a lot of cooperative learning you know, going on, and it makes us think about the instructional practices. Or, hey, we know that first grade is all at a certain point in their social studies unit. So it was a great chance to see holistically the trends and the data that, was, that we were gathering, but it wasn't a chance to do feedback. And this is 
the next model. I believe right. it does that. And, and thank you for saying that, Paul, because it's to get back to that academic leadership team that we were talking about, that, that's the moment where we can bring back all of those ideas and say, we're noticing that you know we want to have this conversation about classroom management you know, throughout the school. Or you know, this gave us an opportunity to think about what's happening um, in language arts instruction. And is that informing what's happening in the task force? Those sorts of things. So um, that, that's a great point. And this, the second method is a little bit more, um, or a lot more, sort of teacher focus. So um, as I mentioned, uh, this gentleman, Kim Marshall, who has been a principal and does lots of work with, with teachers across the country, particularly New York, um, around teacher feedback, came and spent a day, with, almost a whole day, with the academic leadership team. It was just some of the best professional development I've had. It was fantastic. Um, and he really walked us through this method of doing, um, we call it the Marshall Method, there's no actual sort of formal name. We like to, as history teachers, we like the Marshall Plan, but that yes. <laughs> So, ten or more observations here, so you're still in classrooms a lot. When you're thinking about that, um, that graphic that Phil pulled up, that was actually from, from Kim's presentation, where he's saying, if you are, you're able, still able to get a pretty nuanced understanding of what's happening in classrooms if you're doing ten instead of one. And I think it's important to note, the division heads in particular are in classrooms all the time. They're, they're walking around. This is, a, this is a more formalized way of collecting data um, as opposed to just, you know, peggy popping in and saying, hey, you know, tell me what you're working on. So this is, this is sort of more formal. Um, so we're in there for 10 to 15 minutes. We are, they're unexpected in some ways. Um, they, know, they know that we're coming because we have a pilot group that has, um, that has volunteered to do this, but they're not announced. So Leslie and I know we're going into a classroom, but the teacher doesn't, doesn't know that. And that's a, a good thing for a lot of reasons. We wanted to pilot this with teachers who wanted to do it so that that didn't raise their level of anxiety unnecessarily. Um, and to get them to say, oh, okay, this, is, this feels good. This is what I want to be doing. Um, and then we have a 10 minute feedback conference within 24 hours of the lesson. We say, you know, here's, here's something that we, we noticed was, was going great. Here's something we want to talk about. You know, what did you think? So they're brief conversations, um, which is hard for friends <laughs> in particular. We want to just keep talking. Um, and then you give a quick written summary. You send an email and say, here are the three things we talked about. Thanks so much for letting me in your classroom. And it's really provided, um, even in the, you know, just the short time we've been doing it for the last six weeks or so, a really rich opportunity just to sort of talk about teaching. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, so some of the feedback we're hearing initially again, we've been doing it for a couple of weeks, minus two days, um, is that's been very positive. Teachers like the immediate feedback. Um, again, I'll, Peggy and I are, are focusing a lot on lower school. Um, we had one great um, experience. We've had several, but one in particular, we got feedback from the teacher that we went there for the 10 minutes and we saw some things. It was, I would say it's a three, almost four lesson for that 10 minute time we were in there. Um, so we had to get some specific feedback on, on the group learning that was occurring. And literally, within 48 hours, we got an email back from the teacher saying, I took that advice and applied it, and you would not believe the results of the conversation that fifth graders were having because of it. So it was really, it's, it's really validating. It's been really exciting work. Yeah, and then what we are thinking about for the spring is what's called lesson study. Um, this is sort of the gold standard of observation and feedback. Um, it's hard to do only because as we'll, talk, as we'll talk through this, you'll see it's a pretty intensive process. So it requires a team getting together to do the planning and to do the research to say sort of the why of what we're teaching. Um, and then it's, it could be done, you know, you do sort of co-teaching, but often it's, you know, sort of this lesson we put out together that Brad teaches it and we all get feedback together. Um, and it's really about sort of how kids learn best. So the feedback is what was, the, the focus is on the student learning outcomes. As, as Phil mentioned, that's often the forgotten, um, the forgotten element in, in, in much of what's happening in professional development conversations. So this is a model that um, I think teachers will be excited about, and we will hopefully, even if this is not the feedback model that we adopt for next year, there are elements of this I think that are really important for teachers. Um, we'll talk about grade level meetings in a minute, and I think this is that's a, a place where this can really fit to say, okay, you know, can we observe each other teach, talk about what we're teaching? give each other feedback um, in a way that feels helpful and collaborative. Um, teachers often talk about how they like getting peer feedback, they want to hear from their peers, but it's often hard to know where to put that. It can be sort of threatening in a parallel relationship for me to say, okay, I want to review, come, well, that was a bad example, because <laughs> she's my boss, but if we were just co-teaching, um, to say, come give me feedback, that can, it can feel hard as a peer to say, 
well, gee, you know, your classroom was not managed in the way that I would manage it. Here's what I would do differently. Um, and this provides sort of the state framework to do that. So this leads to um, professional development as our, as our second kind of deep topic. It's so when you're giving feedback in classrooms quite a bit, you can begin to really tailor professional development to the needs of your faculty. Um, so <clears throat> I wrote about this in a blog post. There was an interesting study that came out in the spring by TNTP, which is the New Teachers Project. And they had a study called The Mirage. And it was about, um, basically, they looked at three very large public districts across the country in different social economic areas. But their determination was that these districts were spending a lot of money without a lot of bang for their buck. And really, half, less, less than half the teachers said that the PD that they had was tailored to their needs. So we agreed that I guess kind of validating because what they were calling for in that report was a collaborative approach. It was more modeling the professional development after the teaching that you want, um, involving teachers in the process for the topics, and finding ways within the existing structures to allow teachers to grow. And so um, happy to say at Langley that um, we attend all the national regional conferences, <coughs> which is standard. We have a very healthy professional development budget to support that, bring people in, send people out. We have our calendar days that are a lot of professional development, and obviously we bring in speakers and see speakers. But to get even more into it, you can go out and do all those things and hear people and read stuff, but you have to apply it. It's the same thing, the same process with kids in a classroom. They can read a book, they can hear the teacher, they can engage. But what are they going to do with the information? So we have to find time within our existing calendar, the structures to allow them to apply the unit design and so on. So obviously, Kathy has mentioned the APT. For that group, we're talking a lot about the national trends and things we're discussing here, putting the systems in place to grow us as instructional leaders. Department meetings have become a real uh, great time for us to have converse with about very specific content. And our department chairs meet once a month and we talk about the units, the designs, the essential questions, the understandings. That's the what we're teaching the kids. And so we're really making sure that's up to date uh, and relevant. Our division meetings, our division heads do a great job of meeting every once, every couple months. Uh, and not only talking about logistics, that things have to go on in the school day, but also talking about important things, important trends within the divisions. Peggy, Ryan, Leslie all do a great job of finding that, that article that shows some kind of application to the classroom, and they spend time uh, devoted to that. And then I think this year, um, we've done a, a, probably a, a stronger job of looking at the grade level meetings where first grade, second grade, so on, preschool, get a chance to meet weekly. And the two of us with division heads, we're in those meetings, and we're looking at unit design. And this year, we're talking quite a bit about taking one unit, looking at it, redesigning it through very strong essential questions, looking at the assessment piece. So we're using the design of a unit to use professional development and talk about the important aspects of designing curriculum and how you apply the instructional techniques from it. So it's from the planning stages to looking at the kinds of assessments we're offering kids to the actual teaching strategies and learning activities that are involved. And really because of that, we've increased the professional development hours by 25, 30 hours, just by doing that simple change within our grade level meetings. We'll bring articles in, we'll bring books in, look at videos and spend time taking what we're reading but applying it to the everyday uh, practice. So that concludes our talk. And we'd be happy to take any questions and hopefully we have some answers. Yes? Um, I have to apologize if you covered this before I came in, but did, did y'all do this with all the teachers or? I think you said certain teachers opted in. Did certain teachers opt into it or everybody was? So what we are, um, so for the feedback and evaluation models that we're talking about this year, we've presented that to the faculty as these are, these are pilot programs that we're doing for this year. So our traditional observation and feedback model is still in place for this year. So our hope is that by piloting these three different models that we would be able to make a recommendation based on faculty feedback um, and our work within the academic leadership team, partnering with our human resources manager to make a change for next year. Um, so the three minute walkthrough model, there was no opting in. <laughs> Everybody was opted in um, so that we would have an opportunity to be in classrooms all the time. We thought that was important for a lot of reasons. Um, but with this Marshall feedback model, we wanted to have folks opt in 
um, for a lot of reasons, and we were very pleased with the, the number of folks who were interested in opting into that. Um, and it felt more manageable for us as a team, too, to be able to have, um, you know, working with half of the faculty in this way, as opposed to the whole faculty, so that we could sort of work out the kinks and say, is this manageable to do with the whole faculty to do 10, 15 observations per year? Um, and we think that we think that it is, which is which is great. Um, and the feedback has been positive, so we want there to be an opportunity for folks to be able to buy into that and feel good about it. Um, but our traditional feedback model that we've had, we will still have for this year. So division heads will be doing their observations and pre and post observation conversations and write ups and those sorts of things. You know, I think one of the things that's true of evaluation is that if you make it too complicated and complex, you won't do it. Yeah. Um, and so. You know, lots of schools do the one and done because that's something you can commit to. But Marshall makes the case that, you know, one and done just doesn't give you the full spectrum. So what we're trying to do is engage the teachers and find something that we can commit to. Because it means that a division head has to look at his or her calendar for the year and figure out how they're going to get into a classroom 10 or 15 times for every single teacher, do the feedback, and write to them. And so we're kind of easing into it because we want to make a commitment to something that is successful. I am amazed every time we enter into these um, conversations how hungry teachers are for routine feedback. Um, and it goes to the sort of what sustains them in their work. They want to be the best that they can be. And so we've got to figure out a way to do this regularly in, in a way that's sustainable. Yeah, and the other thing, we, we weren't begging for teachers. I mean, yeah. The people who volunteered was just incredible. Um, it's a nice way, as Kathleen said and Elmer said, for us to kind of ease into it with our schedules. Because it is, it's a different mindset to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to email someone and ask for a date, and put it in, and then you agree to it, or defined, and now we're here, and then the feedback. It becomes complicated. And that was part of the training when Kim Marshall came in and said, we're, we're going we're gonna to make this real life. You're going to pull out your calendars and think about if you had to do you know, 150 for the year, or you had to do 300 for the year, and what would it look like in your calendar, on the calendar. The other thing that I thought was fascinating is the difference between 10 or 15 minutes and three yeah. is a lifetime. So we did these video, we, they, Kim Marshall brought us some videos of some sample classrooms and we watched them and, and were surprised that at 12 minutes there was so much to discuss. So you had to, you know, we used to, you're, if you're old school, you think you need to be in there for the full 45, 50 minutes. The reality is when you scrape away the sort of getting started, the winding up, the winding down, you can get a lot done in 12 or 15 minutes. And so if you think of stacking a bunch and doing that 10 or 15 times, you just have so much more usable information. It was really, I was surprised. Yeah, me too. And it's interesting too, I mean, I'm thinking about an observation that Leslie and I did in the primary school a couple weeks ago, and we were there for the student work part. We missed the sort of, you know, the setup. But we could tell, we knew, because the students knew exactly what to do, the task that they were given, they were fully engaged, we knew that the teaching that had happened beforehand was good because the kids knew what was what was happening. That didn't doesn't mean that we didn't then say, hey, teachers, let's sit and talk about what you did. How did you set this up, and why was it successful? So having an opportunity to have those follow up conversations was really powerful, and something that I think that we felt too was sort of missing from the first um, three minute walkthrough model. But it, it, it validates teachers to be able to have that opportunity to say, yeah, this is this is sort of how I got here. Um, but to Eleanor's point, 10, 12 to 15 minutes is, is a shockingly long amount of time in a classroom. It's really, you know, you sort of know what's happening, which is a good thing. One thing I like about the 10 to 15 minute um, observation as well, in my training, because the Marshall Method plan has been um, only around the last five or six years, which is kind of gained some steam. So we both come from more of the Charlotte Daniels and UVA, very big standard benchmarks, trying to check things off. So, you know, I go with the mindset thing, gosh, I'd love to be here for 45 minutes. But the nice thing is when you have the conversation with the teacher, is that they get a chance to talk about their lesson before you were in there and after, which develops that reflective practice. So then they're thinking about, oh, after you left, X, Y, and Z happened. And now I think about it. So it's engaging them more as part of the process, which is really nice. Which I didn't really anticipate. Yeah. But they're really, they're really more of a conversation. When it's the 45 minute, it's you kind of sitting down saying, here's what I saw. You know, you opened with this and blah blah blah, and Johnny got up and did that, and then you went in groups. This is them really telling their story and reflecting on the practice, which I think is really great. I would add the other piece to the Marshall um, way of doing things is that follow-up email. 
And even though, as division heads, you might go into the classrooms a lot, you don't necessarily follow up with that email. And then that becomes your documentation. So then when you're writing up your end of the year evaluation that we do with everybody, then you can read through those and see the progression of what's happening in the classroom. So that, that becomes the real nugget in all of this as well. I have a two-part question. One, you kind of mentioned what you guys are going to do next year off of this. And two, when you evaluated the teachers, have you made decided to make changes in some of the staff? I mean, like, I think this teacher would be better here, or, or are you just trying to focus more on how to make them better teachers where they are? So we're not using, so this is a pilot program, so we're not using this in the sense to evaluate yet. Um, and I think when you're giving feedback, you have to have a story of what's going on. So obviously at some point when you look at where a body of work, you make those determinations with it. At this point, we're not there with it. That's why we're bringing the faculty on board to make sure that this is a method that they feel comfortable with and feel good about. You want to hire really well, that's the most important thing, and then grow your teachers. So obviously this is used for feedback and I'll say evaluation as well. But you got to hire really, really well, and I think we do. We have a very rigorous top process here where you know, we go through hundreds of resumes, we do the phone interview, we um, bring them on campus, they do demonstration lessons, they meet with a whole variety of different constituents on the campus. Um, we check references thoroughly, sometimes we have to, we can go to schools and see them on site. So we do that well. And the best thing is you hire well and then you, you help them grow. And that's really what, what, what we want to do with this method. But in those situations where Maybe you didn't hire well, yes, you would use this to hopefully grow and improve the teacher. But if not, you gotta make those determinations whether maybe it's a better grade, different environment, or this is the right place for that. And you know, the other thing that's great about this is it gives you an opportunity. If you're seeing a lot of, to go back to Marshall, ones, you don't just persist with that process. Then it's like 0911, and you come in and we're in and we're, you know, we're doing an intervention. We haven't had to do that in my time here. Um, but it does allow you, if you're doing the one and done model, you could not get into someone's classroom until December and there's been three you know, months of you know, concerning um, adjustment. Um, so it really allows you to sort of figure out if the teacher's having an issue globally or if they're struggling with something in particular. It's like a rapid diagnosis. Um, and so we haven't had that in my time at Langley we, because we put such an emphasis on hiring, we hire experienced teachers. But there's always the possibility that you're going to get a kind of a 911 and you're going to have someone who needs a lot of support. But then you kind of almost step out of this and then you're doing something more intensive to try to um, assess what the situation is. But this is what's exciting about this is that this is for um, growing good teachers to great teachers and great teachers to expert teachers and to support them so that they don't become, I mean, teaching is so much work and there's so much that happens at night and on the weekends. This honors that and respects it, and it gives them a vehicle so that the people that are supervising them can recognize and acknowledge how much work goes into it and help them fine tune it. So it really is a way of, once we hire those great people, retaining them and growing them, and hopefully getting them to commit to this place, because the profession of education is changing. People aren't making 30-year commitments to educational institutions anymore. That's not what millennials are thinking when they graduate from college. So we need a paradigm for engaging them in their professional life that will work over the long haul. 20, 30 years ago, teaching was an art, and now it's uh, an art and science. It's a combination because there's so much research coming out about how kids learn. Um, the other piece about Marshall that he says unit design is such an important um, part of professional development and feedback as well. So imagine teachers getting 10 to 15 um, moments of feedback along with meeting in grade level meetings and talking about their practice and how their unit design is working classroom so we're really amping up that quite a bit so it's a combination so the professional conversations so and it relates so when you're sitting in a grade level meeting and we have been in everyone's room three or four times the impact of the grade level conversation is at a much higher level because we know what's going on they know we know what's going on and we've talked about practice and so the conversations of common language we're talking about you know cooperative learning at a high level talk about higher order questioning at a higher level. Um, it, just, it, just, it just blends so nicely. I wonder if you um, incorporate uh, in this method 
um, any feedback from parents and most importantly from students? Good question. Um, we have we've talked a lot about student feedback. Brad Lance is a big uh, proponent of <laughs> collecting student feedback as a wonderful member of our uh, academic leadership team. And there are lots of different ways to do that. So we're, we're thinking about the best way to do that. Um, it feels easier in a middle school environment um, because most primary middle school students are all, I love my teachers. And that's, you know, that's, that's the best feedback you can. I was having a conversation with my four year old on Leah this morning asking what we were doing. I said, well, we're going to talk to some parents about what's happening in classrooms. They just want to know what they're, um, they said, they're, you have to tell them what the students are doing. She was you know, really trying to be helpful. But and then she just started waxing poetic about how much she loved her teacher. So that's that's the feedback you usually get from, from little kids. So thinking about the best models to do that. Um, there are lots of models out there, um, so that's actually that's a great question. That's something we're thinking about a lot. Um, and for parents, we hear from parents a lot, which is which is helpful, um, and we're grateful for that. We think that partnership is so important. And looking for ways to institutionalize and sort of codify that is a little bit trickier, um, but certainly something we're exploring yeah, absolutely. as well. I think we want to get this this piece down first. Mm -hmm. Teacher and academic leadership team conversation going on. We bragged each other in a second. Though. But the research shows, I think, for student feedback, it's third grade and higher, I believe, is what we're seeing. And it's usually a survey, um, which usually we find is best if it goes right to the teacher. And that's where the teacher is more comfortable using that kind of feedback. Do you want to add that? Just to follow up on my question. Sure. Because you know, a lot of public schools are using only test results yes. to determine, um, uh, to determine how students learn best, because that's one of the uh, yeah. one of the ways of evaluating teachers. So I was wondering if you take uh, take the students' result in uh, in consider into consideration, or sim or also use surveys. Students' so, surveys. So are you talking sort of results from student outcomes? Yes. That's a, I mean it's important for us to know, and that gets at what Phil is talking about with the. When we do unit design work, we start with the outcome. So what do we hope students will sort of know and be able to do at, at the end of this? Um, so that's a success, that's the sign of a successful sort of teaching moment when the kids are sort of where you want them to be. Um, and when you look at sort of more nationalized or standardized tests, like you know, students that are great enough to take the ERB, you know, Peggy Wright and Amy Jones have conversations with teachers about those results to say sort of what, what do we know? Based on we are not teaching to this test, but what do we know from this? We want to make sure it's a worthwhile endeavor to make kids sit for, for hours and take these tests. And what, what can we know from that? So there are very detailed, nuanced conversations. Peggy is a real data data person, so she loves to dig into those um, with with the teams and teachers and talk about that. So I don't I think I can go out on a limb and say I don't think we would ever tie that necessarily to evaluation of a teacher, but it's an important data point to say, okay, as a school, we know that. You know, our kids have really done much better in reading comprehension over the last couple of years. What have we done to sort of shore that up? And, and where are areas where we, other areas where we might want to shore up and think about that? So looking at it sort of as a school from grades three to eight for the ERB results, or um, you know, looking at the AIMS data that we start collecting when kids are four and five years old, that early literacy and math, all the way up through eighth grade during that benchmarking. So what do we know about sort of how kids are learning within those contexts? Um, through all their time at language is really important. Yeah, in addition to standardized testing, I can tell you the teachers are constantly looking at their own formal assessments. It doesn't have to be a national test mm -hmm. to be that. So they're always having at grade level meetings conversations about uh, with the reading specialists, with the math specialists, how they did the post tests, how they did on pretest, comparing the data. Same thing in writing. You know, a lot of times they will write something before a unit, and the kids will be part of the conversation of how their writing is progressed. So, yeah, some will say those informal, but there really are formal assessments that are just not standardized mm -hmm. that, that we look at. And that's important data as well. We yes, essentially something really important too, Phil. Just as we talk about sort of enhancing a culture of professional development in the school, I think that the addition of um, some resource folks, we've heard about this throughout the course of the year, but that's really bolstered um, a professional learning community where teachers are having conversations with, with coaches, instructional coaches, to say, all right, let's talk about this math lesson together, or here are some resources that I pulled. So that has really sort of gotten in the water too um, in terms of the professional development culture. It's been really great to think about that. And oh, oh, yeah. go ahead. There's another question. Um, so you mentioned earlier children learn differently. 
Yeah. Um, can you just comment when you're in the classrooms and you're observing? Can you comment what are you looking for, and and how easy it is is it for a teacher to teach two different learning styles? I don't really I don't have a grasp on what that means and what you're looking for in the classrooms. So that's that's the buzzword of different differentiated learning. And so teachers, when we talk about this in our unit design, they look at the kids' readiness level. Uh, they look at their interests, they look at their learning styles. So whenever they're designing units, we're looking at different opportunities to provide kids based upon what they know about their classroom. So a lot of times we'll sit and ask, okay, so the assessment at the end of the unit is um, a poster, or it's a pen and paper, or it's an essay, or it's a song. We're, we're, we're talking to them about what are the options available and why are you making those instructional decisions or assessment decisions within the classroom? And are you trying to get as many learners and learning styles available there? So what we're looking for, and we'll have that in the conversation, we might say, okay, you know, everyone was, was in a group and they were writing a poem. Um, but you gave the topic, this is just an example, but you gave the topic to write about their weekends. Um, why would you give maybe, you know, talk to your decision about why just the weekend could they talk about uh, their favorite sports figure, or they talk about something else. So there's choice within that. So we're, we're, what we're really looking for, what are the activities, why they made those instructional decisions, and what choices are available for students within the classroom. So that's what we look for when we're in there. And again, it's 10 to 15 minutes. But a lot of times, if you're in the middle of a lesson, you're seeing it. Even at the beginning of the lesson, we're seeing the setup to go into it. And we can always have the conversations and the feedback saying, where did it go, what were your choices, and they'll bring those units with them. They'll bring those lesson plans with them. They'll bring the activities so we can actually see and discuss it. So we're looking for a variety of activities, but not just because it's fun, but it's based upon the needs of the kids. So that's what we're asking them. That's what they're kind of giving us back to us. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you are so far above me on all this stuff. I mean, I'm back at the simple, yeah. like, what specifically are the learning styles? Like, have we, it, yep, yep, sure. what are they, like, at the basic levels? Like, what are the five, three, however many learning styles that are out there? Yeah. So you have a kid who could be uh, much more in terms of auditory, you have a kid who's um, visual, so they could, they could sit and listen and just take it all in. And there's kids who are more kinesthetic, who need to be up, moving about, hands on. So we're looking at, I mean, there's just two examples, two or three examples that, and we want to see a variety of those kinds of activities in there. Some will say, well, shouldn't you just make all the kids do it because those who, you know, struggle in a certain area need to be brought up. It's really about the learning, and you want the kids to retain information and understand the information. And so putting them in their stronger area is important so that they're actually understanding and comprehending. Down the line, I think you want to push in different areas. But we're looking for really for a variety of learning activities in the classroom. One of the speakers I heard once that helped me think about this was the idea that in order to learn, you have to take information in. So there's input, there's processing, and there's output. In every lesson, there are many decisions about how the kids are going to take information in. Then you have to recognize that in a classroom of 15, there may be 15 speeds at which they process, ways at which they process, prompts that would help them process, questions that would drive their learning. And then the output is, do you ask them to tell you? Do, they, do you ask them to show you? Do you, ask, do you ask them to write it? Do you ask them to produce it? So if you think about sort of just like a computer, it's got to come in, something's got to happen, and it's got to come out. And that's got to happen every single day, and it's got to build on prior learning. It has to be sticky and stay. All of those are educational decisions. How long you wait when you ask a question before someone produces an answer. This is, I was terrible at this. Every time I was observed, I'd like to ask a question. You called on the first person. There were three people who were coming up with their answer, but you didn't give them enough time. They just couldn't get there because you went right to the person who had the supercomputer. You know, have them write, have them think. So all of that is, I mean, there are lots of fancy terms for it, but that's what a really gifted teacher starts to figure out. Of the little bodies that are in the room, who's really fast? Who needs more time? Who needs to see it? Who needs to say it? Who needs to hear it? And all of that is different. Um, and so it's really capitalizing. And then to Phil's point, you then go into a lesson discussion and say, why did you make that decision? Because in making that decision, you might have captured 50% of the kids in the room, but for the other 50%, that was really hard. Or what do you know about your learners? Yeah. Um, and things like that. I want to say one word um, about learning styles that might be helpful for you as parents to think about, too. 
we brought in a speaker called Joanne D last year, um, who really, her work really resonated, I think, with all of us um, and the faculty as well. And she talked about what Phil was describing as, you know, everybody has their areas of, of strength, and those are sort of the big rubber bands in your brain. Um, and that you have, you know, we are pretty comfortable getting up and talking to all of you, and there are some people for whom that would be absolutely terrifying. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't sometimes make Somebody with a smaller little rubber band stretch that a little bit to say, we know it's scary for you to get up in front of a group. You need to do that. Um, so to give kids an opportunity to say, okay, well, I'm not good at math, or well, yeah, you are, but that's you know that's some, that's a rubber band that you have that you're going to keep stretching a little bit. It's going to keep stretching. You know, there's some elasticity there. Um, not to push the metaphor too far, but you know what I mean. But there's there's this idea at Langley that you know we certainly want to, to highlight strengths and, and to make sure that kids are doing. Um, things that they feel good about, but you have to sort of push them out of that sort of sort of that whole zone of proximal development where you're able to sort of push them outside of their comfort zone a little bit to say, we think it's important that you, um, you know, you're not just reading, it's great that you love superhero books and you want to keep reading those, but you know, we want to push you a little bit to read, and maybe you'd like to learn about frogs a little bit, and let's read that too. So um, really expert teachers, as Eleanor is saying, um, know how to sort of push kids to so they can stretch that elastic without it breaking, if that, if that sort of makes sense. Um, so that we all have those sort of big rubber bands, those are the learning styles that we default to. Um, I went to a conference, um, as I said, over the weekend, and people around me that were sort of furiously writing every single thing down, I, I took a couple notes, but I was able to sort of take all of that in, in an auditory way and feel good that I was able to retain most of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that I didn't need to sort of give myself a crutch to write down um, a note here and there as well. So, while you have those big rubber bands, you also need to be aware of the fact that there are those little rubber bands in your brain that you need to sort of stretch and think about so the kids don't fall apart when something gets sort of hard down the line. I wanted to go back to that data piece. Um, we were talking about when we use, how we use the data. Um, one of the conversations that we have when we look at ERB scores or AIMS or whatever is globally what's happening across the grade level but in the classroom, but then also individually for students. The other question that comes up is, is this data representative of this child? Because a lot of times a child may take a test and as a teacher you're sitting there and you go, I know you know this. And so that's where it comes in where you'll use different modes of assessment. And so a teacher may sit down with a child and talk through it and realize, oh yeah, you've got the learning points but maybe we need to work on just the testing and how, how you um, express it. So all of those pieces um, come into it. Can I ask a, an over-the-top general question? Uh, in your very first slide, you mentioned how important it is for a teacher, uh, for, for the child in the teaching effort and how one is a product of the other one, basically, and how important the teacher presence is in the classroom. At which point in our life do we go in not needing that? And we see most of the college courses now are being offered online, and the actual presence of it. I mean, at which point, at which, at which age, it's not as important to have the teacher active in there? Great question. I, I think that's being debated. Yeah. It's been well, what you're hearing now a lot in the learning um, is because, you know, because of our smartphones, right? Because you say you say kids now can look up Jeopardy questions within seconds, right? And know all the dates of battles and recall. So it's more about the understanding of why you would go to war versus the dates of going to war. And, you know, history teacher, again, it's hard for us, yeah. but um, I think it's all important. So it, it's, it's a question of access, absolutely right. And at one point, now this goes back to also saying for some, they could get on the computer and listen to a professor or engage in, in activities off campus or at home or whatever and learn it really well. And there are some that need that social environment of 15 kids around um, with the teacher engaging in small group activities. So I just think it's another, at this point, it's another method or strategy for learning. You know, not to, not to say it's going to become even more important, I think it is much more relevant to where we are. Um, do I ever think it will replace the classroom? Probably probably not. But I just think it's it's a method where some kids could do it and, and, and love it and do it really well. I mean, my girls at home, 
will go on the YouTube channel and watch the Rainbow Loom, right? And watch some kid do it, and they're there, and within seconds, they're creating some new figure on a Rainbow Loom. And that's a method of online. I mean, just the possibilities are endless. I just think it's it's a new a new way, a new strategy of learning. It's an interesting thing. So about, I guess it's about five or six years ago, I took a course on sort of how to, there was the online school for girls, which was founded in part by um, at this school locally, and they were offering this sort of year-long course and how do you um, how do you sort of create this online environment that, that sort of mirrors your, your feeling and mission as an independent school? And I really struggled with it. This was before um, most schools had a learning management system in place, and I really was like, why can't I figure out, I'm pretty smart, why can't I figure out sort of how to do this lightly and think this through? And it occurred to me that, oh, because our mission, when we think about every child every day, that relationship, as Phil was talking about, was so important, so integral that there wasn't necessarily a way six or seven years ago to capture that relationship in a preschool through eighth grade environment that felt real and authentic and felt like lately. Um, and when I think about what we have now, this sort of blend of really expert quality teaching happening in the classroom, but then an online space in the LMS where kids are able to collaborate more together and hear from their teachers, that to me feels like the right the right blend in a preschool through eighth grade environment. Certainly, if you go to high school, I think to, to your original question, sort of what's the breakoff point? Um, relationships don't really matter in a high school environment or a college environment. Um, but kids, if they have the right foundation, they're able to access that information in a way um, that feels more developmentally appropriate. Brad, I don't know if you want to chime in on any of this, if there's anything that we're missing. In like, uh, in, uh, in not all, not to have any thought of, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, taking the same exact type. How do we know if she's going to learn better with the teacher presence or uh, online? Like, and I'm not talking so much about this age because uh, I was faced in uh, a choice of taking a course myself uh, on campus or online. And um, I was thinking what may be a better, uh, you know. Um, everyone has different opinions on it. And I think, like as to what they were saying, um, everyone learns a little bit differently and they have their own learning preferences and learning styles. Um, as much as I love technology, I think there's nothing that comes close to replacing the actual relationship of a student being in a classroom and having that relationship not only with the teacher, but also with the other students. Um, they get to see how other students learn. They get to bounce questions off of each other um, versus something where it's online and, and they don't get a chance to really have that human interaction as much as possible. I personally think that online learning in a sense of like a, a massive open online class or a MOOC is, is something like the next best thing or it's a it's a cheaper way to offer um, another venue of being able to learn in a different way. But I still believe firmly that the classroom is the way to go um, just because it's not all about learning the information. It's about supporting a human being and also about having the, the fundamentals and you know, balancing that character and social emotional development. Um, so you get all those things when you have a regular classroom. I think the online part is, is kind like the next best thing um, if you can't necessarily get into that environment. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about incentives for teachers. Last year at a presentation, in response I think to a question, Eleanor mentioned that as a private school or this private school was unable to offer salaries that matched, for instance, the public schools in the area, but that one of the things that she could offer teachers was much more professional development. And so I'm wondering, when you do go into a classroom and you observe excellence in teaching, are the teachers rewarded? Or is the, is the school able to reward the teachers? And if so, how? Well, I think the, um, the whole question, of, that's, a, that's a huge question in education right now in terms of, sort of merit-based pay and, and all of that. Um, and just our salaries, do we do start at the same, about the same level as Fairfax County, so we are they are competitively, um, <clears throat> it's sort of that overtime question that gets a little trickier, but um, they do commence sort of at the same, the same base level. I think that reward for, for just speaking as, you know, somebody who's been teaching for, for 16 or 17 years at this point, um, there is the sort of monetary reward, which is important, but nobody necessarily gets into teaching thinking they're, they're going to get rich. Um, but their <laughs> reward, which is hard to believe. The reward I think that you get as a teacher, and this is not to be, everybody has to pay the rent and the student loans and all that, so I don't need to minimize that at all. But um, the reward you get as a teacher is to sort of be fulfilled in your professional life. So you want to be in a place that supports you 
that helps you grow, that recognizes that you are um, that you're that you're growing all the time. And teaching is a very, I mean, we're those of us who are sitting in this room right now happen to be academic leaders um, who many of us started out as teachers, but the the teaching profession is quite horizontal. So you have to find ways, you're not going to get um, promoted as a teacher. You might have leadership opportunities. You could be a you know, department chair, or you could be um, you know, a grade level captain, and those sorts of things. But those often don't come with much monetary reward. So the, often the teachers are motivated by things sort of outside of that. Um, so I, I, my sense, and I, was, I don't remember that, that comment, but my sense is probably what she meant was that we're, we're hoping to enrich the experience for teachers um, in ways that you know sort of aren't, aren't financial in scope. But it was interesting. I keep referring to this conference just because I just got back. But the number of um, you know, I, I sort of took for granted that I would be able to go and go to this conference, and it's you know sort of thought leaders. And I was talking to a principal at the public school in Massachusetts, and he was saying that this sort of the finagling that they had had to do to get two teachers to come and to sort of present back it was sort of mind-boggling to think about that, just the lengths that they had to go to to go to this conference. So it made me, I feel lucky all the time to, to have worked in a school like Lindy for, for 10 years um, because I've been afforded so many opportunities to grow and learn and think and we're able to bring that back to the school in a very real way. So the fact that those opportunities are available to teachers are, are pretty meaningful, even if you can't go in and say, here, here's an extra, you know, 1500 bucks for doing, you know, for doing a great job today, um, that there is a culture of support and appreciation. And that's thanks in large part to the, the parent group too. I mean, when you get to go and say, oh, Kyle's brought in breakfast today, or um, the board supported you know, breakfast last week, or um, you know, come to the auction and you don't have to, to pay, you can just come and enjoy this beautiful evening. I mean, those are, those, that stuff really matters. And to see parents stand up and raise the paddle and say, we believe in you as, as teachers. I get chills every time we talk about it. It's such a beautiful moment at the auction. Um, but that stuff really matters too. So. Um, I know that's sort of a, a soft pedaling <laughs> response, so the short answer is no. Um, but I don't know if you want to chime in. Well, I think you make a good point. Teachers who teach independent education is a conscious choice. Yeah. Um, and you think back to the very beginning of the presentation where you say that number one reason teachers leave the profession is because they're not supported. It's not because of pay, it's not because of benefits, it's not because of pensions or anything <laughs> like that. It's because they're not supported. And that primary stat is is based on not just you know you think well it's probably for teachers in urban areas it's not the case it's just across the country it's a it's, it's a it's a good um, overall study about that so when you create an environment here where we're trying to support teachers even more and give positive feedback and give constructive feedback and really enrich them and make them all master teachers and give them those kinds of resources they just can't do that it's right. the, the public schools are teaching towards tests that they have thirty in their classroom it's very difficult here so. And their professional developments, beginning of the year, end of the year, and, and that's that's it. Um, so we're, we're ongoing. So we're trying to prove, really provide that supportive environment that's so important to keep teachers here. Yeah. Um, so this was really helpful to hear about uh, your the team's focus on teacher evaluations and professional development. What are some of the things that didn't make it into the presentation today, the priorities for the senior academic team? Or once you, you've clearly put, continue to put so much resource into this teacher evaluation model that will become part of the system. What's next? Just give it, you know, without going into a lot of depth, like what are the other things that you say are really, that are on your wish list that you want this senior team to devote time and resources to once you get some of these things more formalized into the calendar? That's a great question. Well, we start by, we have, Sort of a plan. There's a three-year plan. We'll talk about that since we um, connected. Um, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the other sort of chunk of, of work that's taken up um, much of Phil's and, and my time this year, which has been around the task force work that we're doing. So um, the, you've heard, already heard Eleanor talk about this, but the, the math task force, the literacy task force, the social and emotional learning task force, and the world language task force. Um, Phil and I are, are, are leading in conjunction with, with other folks. Um, to sort of look at what I think the next level will be sort of what are the recommendations of, of those task forces and that will shape in many ways um, much of the work that happens next year but there's also sort of the, the three-year plan for the APT group um, yeah. so, about what's next. so we talk a lot about the instructional leadership um, we're doing a lot on um, unit design we'll continue that work next year and go deeper into some of those units and, and increase the um, breadth and depth of that um, and then we'll start talking, you'll hear us talking a lot more. We are now about inquiry learning and taking those units 
and really get the kids to explore within it in all areas, uh, world language and technology and science and math and literacy and so on. So you're going to see that kind of expand. So really next year we're going to continue our, our conversations about what is good teaching, unit design, and then we're going to get into deeper um, conversations about the and what that looks like for kids and the outcomes that will produce because of it. I mean, the two topics we put up here are really so encompassing of, of, of many things. When you talk about teacher quality, you talk about professional development, we can talk about the instructional decisions a teacher makes. We can also talk about the outcomes. You can also talk about the assessment. You can talk about the strategies they use in the classroom. It's just, it's, it's a great thing, and it's application. So when we're doing professional development sessions, um, it's not just read and regurgitate back to us. It's apply it, bring it, show it, Give us an example in the classroom. Um, our professional development day, the first one we had in October, was very um, up and about, moving, was engaging, it was conversations, it was read, it was reflect, it was apply, work within division, work within department. So again, we're trying to model the things we want to see in classrooms, and we are seeing in classrooms, with what we're doing in our professional development. So we're engaging teachers in activities that challenge them to take information in, process it, and then produce something. So all of our sessions when we meet, there might be some conversations. Sometimes there are learning activities. Sometimes there's demonstration. There's a variety of stuff that's going on. And it's been so rewarding. Um, I've been visiting a couple other schools recently <laughs> for the planning of a move. But it's been so affirming to come back here and to see the faculty culture that's in place that supports this kind of thinking. That the people who are here who want to be here and want to do this work, it's really um, you know, it's, 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 that's such a, a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to be part of a team that is leading a group of faculty that, that want to do that because that's um, it's just not the case everywhere. So yeah, part thing. of the task force work, we, we went to some local schools, some local independent schools, and saw what they were doing in world language and see the math and so on. And it's funny, we're we are a year or two a year two years ahead of them in terms of our conversations about where we want our program to be. So it's just <laughs> it, that's validating, and they want to come here and see the work that we're doing. So it's really it's, it's been great. What is the percentage of your input uh, on how a unit will be designed versus uh, the subject matter teacher's input? So we're coming to, to the, uh, we want common language and common idea or common philosophy about how we design units. So we're all coming with it with the idea that we want the end, the outcome of the student to be discussed first. And then how we frame questions and general goals for that unit is kind of the, the second part or, or embedded with that. Then we're asking them to say, along the way, how do you know kids are learning? So that's the kind of second part of that. And the third part is, what are the activities you're going to do in that unit to get them there? So, um, but we're not saying, okay, you have to do that activity, you have to do that activity, you have to do this. The framework for the design is is universal at Langley, but they know their kids. So we're not going to say and say, well, you shouldn't do that. We might ask why you're doing that, and if they say, well, you know. Third of my class really responds well. I put the visuals up, and the third need to be up and moving. That's why I'm doing X, Y, and Z. They have that freedom to do that. And, and just to clarify too, that this is not brand new work. This is sort of where we are right now. We um, we've been using the sort of same framework, the understanding by design framework, with it is an essential essential question that during understandings. Um, we mapped our whole curriculum seven years ago, but that was the framework we decided we wanted to use. So those conversations have been ongoing. So um, there are some, I know there are some schools where a teacher just sort of goes in and says, this is what I'm going to do this year, and sort of rolls it out. That's not the way that we do things here. We have departments in place that are reviewing, in, in terms of the subject matter experts, are saying, is this the right thing? They're doing curriculum reviews all the time every year. Um, but this is just sort of the, the work that Phil and I are doing this year to sort of push it to grade levels and that sort of thing. So um, there is sort of a system. There has been a system in place to, to sort of answer that question. I need to jump in here. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to say that there is a real culture of collaboration here, and we hire people who want to collaborate. And that, unfortunately, is very unusual in a lot of schools. A lot of schools are really old schools in terms of I go in my classroom and I close the door and I do what I want to do. And we we've gotten rid of that and so people do sit, teachers do have ownership and they bring forth ideas um, of things that they want to do in the classroom and people are really excited about sharing and so I think it really changes the kinds of conversations 
that you can have because teachers don't feel threatened that, you know, oh, I'm going to tell you what to do, but realize that it is a conversation. Thank you all so much for coming. Our doors are always open. Yep. Bill's in the middle school. I'm up next to Eleanor. Um, so if you ever want to pop in or call or email, um, that's, a, that's a sincere offer. Our doors really are yep. always open. So please feel free to stop in. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.